Okay, hi everybody. Welcome back one more time. Uh, <clears throat> when we were last together, at least virtually, or at least I imagine we were together, uh, we did statistical models. Of course, not remotely everything about statistical models, but an introduction, the notation, what we were going to do with it, and a uh, reorganization of how we were going to describe them so that we were prepared to uh, describe very, very general um, statistical models. So now what we're going to do is we're going to um, focus on the thing that the statistical models is modeling, which is the data generation process. The data generation process is really the key to the whole thing. So this is our outline. We've done overview and logistics statistical models, and now we're going to do data generation processes. Afterwards comes probability, and then we'll, we'll get to the details of, of modeling. Um, so in order to focus on these, on these models, I want, to, I want to, and in order to focus on the data generation process, the thing that we need to really understand to write it down a statistical model, I'm going to ask this ridiculous question. What's the probability that these goats are real? Which goats? These goats. Okay, have a look, have a close look at this photograph. I want you to tell me what's the probability that these goats are real. Are these, are these real? Is that a real photograph? Or did I just put them in there, okay, in the, in the photograph? Is, is this a real thing? Have a look at that. If this were a class, I would ask you to vote. I'd ask you to commit yourself. Are those goats real? Oh, wait a second. Let's have a closer look. See those goats in the tree? Isn't that ridiculous? Or maybe it's so ridiculous that it's not true. Are they real? How would you know? Okay, how would you know? Right? And look at that guy. Okay, so how can I convince you that these goats are real? <clears throat> how can I convince you? What's the key piece of information that's missing? It's the data generation process. Once you have the data generation process, the, the story, the, the verified story as to where they came from, then, uh, then you can believe that the goats are real or not real. So let's see if I can convince you. <clears throat> well, I took the photos. So I just make that statement to you, I took the photos. And if I make that statement to you, then you believe me, right? Well, you know, should you trust me, right? In science, we don't trust, we verify, right? We, we, we lock down every assumption whenever, whenever possible. Okay, so um, I add a bit, of, a bit of information here. I didn't just take the photos, I was on a family vacation. So now you know a little bit more, if you trust me, about the data generation process. I was on a family vacation, I stopped by the side of the road and I saw some goats and trees. Well, that's still a little weird, right? Okay, so um, how about, <clears throat> so the, it is weird, but the story helps some, right? Because it's not like, like <clears throat> we would find this in Cambridge, right? Um, Okay, so how about some evidence? So here's some evidence. In the photos I took on the family vacation. Okay, so here they are. Instead of a classy video um, uh, software where we can get things to move, I just did it by hand. In any event, see the goats in the trees? Okay, that's Abdul carrying one of the goats. <clears throat> and we get a little closer look at the goats and a little closer look at the goat. See that guy? He's just sitting up there in the tree. See that? Okay, that's Anya, she's going to Georgetown next year. <clears throat> uh, see that? Oh, there's this goat. That's Ella, she's a G3 in physics at Harvard, and that's her personal goat and with Abdul. And it's not actually her goat. Um, <clears throat> there's some of those goats. Uh, there she is, okay. Um, see the goats? Isn't that crazy? Look at that. <laughs> that's me standing under the tree looking up at the goat, right? Way out there on a branch. Like, what the heck are they doing there? Okay, that's Max and Greg, right? Okay, so, and, you know, Max really likes the goat. That's Kathy over on the left, okay? D this is family vacation photos. Or maybe it's Gary photoshopping, right? You know, how do you know? Okay, how can you, how can you believe me? Or if these were your data, obviously the goats are an analogy for data, okay? If these were your data, how could you convince people? Or how would you convince yourself that this is real, right? Maybe I'm just really good at Photoshop. How would you know? Okay, so would it help you if I told you why the goats are in the trees? So let me, let me tell you why the goats are in the trees and give you a bit more information. Okay, so why are they there? Well, these trees are argan trees. <clears throat> and <clears throat> you may actually have heard of argan, right? The argan trees have argan fruit and argan fruit is, um, is valuable. These trees were <clears throat> are in Morocco. 
So that was where our family vacation was. And argan trees have this argan fruit, which are valuable to the locals. Why are they valuable? Here's why. So what happens is uh, the locals want to get the fruit. How do they get it? Well, they could climb up the trees, but it's really hard to do that. They can't climb as well as the goats. So they send the goats up to the trees who seem perfectly happy with climbing up the trees. The goats eat the argon fruit. They eat it, okay? And then they poop out, they digest the, 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 like the, the, the peach flesh. If it was peach, if it, was pe it looks like a peach. And then they poop out the, 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 sea, the, um, the pit, basically. Then they take all, they take, then, then they, basically women, it's only women, they pick up the goat poop, they put it in, they clean it all off, they take out the like peach pit-like things, they put them on stones, they take another rock, they pound the, the peach pit equivalents, they get the seed inside, they put all the seeds into a big, bar into a big place and then they grind it up and it makes argan oil. You've heard of argan oil? So they take the argan oil and they sell it to American companies to put in all kinds of, co in all kinds of products to put on women's faces and hair and all kinds of other things. So there's some things in men's products as well. Um, so that's actually where argan oil comes from. And that's the story. And it's true, I promise. Okay. So I wanted to just tell you this crazy story <clears throat> because the uncertainty in the data generation process produces substantive uncertainty about any conclusion we would draw from a set of data. You have to know the whole data generation process from which the data are emerge. Um, for data to be useful, you have to know the data generation process. The, to the extent that you're missing some piece of the chain of evidence from the world to the conclusions, which is the data generation process, that is additional uncertainty in your results. So we always focus on that whole chain of evidence. You don't just take a data set that somebody hands you and says, here it is. You trace it down to its original origin in the world. After all, we're studying the world. We're not studying a bunch of data, right? So you have to know the connection between the world you're studying, the chain of evidence, right? And the conclusions you have. <clears throat> um, theory, the stories I told you, are helpful um, for understanding the data generation process. And data is helpful for theory. In other words, you need evidence all along the way. Um, okay, so, <clears throat> so that's the tale. But how will we use these data generation processes? <clears throat> well, we'll use them for probability. Models of probability actually produce data and therefore they produce the data generation process and therefore probability models are models of a data generation process. If I say I have a fair coin, a fair coin means probability of heads is 0.5, and I flip the coin, <clears throat> then the probability that I'm going to see a heads is 0.5. If I flip the coin a thousand times, I would expect to see about 500 heads, plus or minus a number that I can actually calculate. Right? So th if I, in that case, in the case of probability, I know the entire data generation process because it, under the model of probability, I decide what the data generation process is and I implement it. I implement it. <clears throat> if I'm doing random assignment, I know what the random generation function is. That's probability. Interestingly, statistical inference is essentially the opposite of probability. In, in probability, we know the model and we can generate the data. In statistical inference, we have the data and what we really want to know is what's the model. So for example, um, that, that, that coin which we know is fair and we flip it, we flip it. In statistical inference, all we have is the results of a set of flips. You know, we can flip the coin ourselves and decide and see what the, what the zeros and ones are and so then that could be our data set. But our question is, is it a fair coin? probability assumes it's a fair coin, statistical inference would try to estimate whether it is a fair coin. So these are the opposites of one another. And also we will of course use probability in, uh, in, the, in the service of making statistical models. So um, that's where data generation processes are useful. And the where? And the answer is basically everywhere. We always have to focus on them. Okay. <clears throat> in order to analyze them, in order to understand them, we're going to use statistical simulation. Simulation is a terrific tool. 
it's used for an, uh, quite a number of different things. It's used to understand and assume data generation process. So if somebody tells you that we have generated the data in the following way, it's actually very helpful to simulate the data from that model, the model that is assumed, and then we can look at the results and we can get a feel for it and we can understand it and we can see whether it has the properties that we expect. So it's very, very helpful to understand a data, data generation process. Second is it turns out that, a date, that um, <coughs> simulation is really good for solving probability problems. Problems that you may have taken in, in earlier courses where they give you this complicated, crazy, crazy problem and, and ask you to make these calculations, okay? Um, so simulation will, will help you with that. Um, it's very good for evaluating estimators. So what does that mean? So an estimator is you take data and you, then you apply some function to the data. Like we will always add up the data and divide by n or something more compli complicated like x prime x inverse x prime y, the, the, reg the regression coefficients. <clears throat> um, the estimator is the function of the data. Well, you can make up an estimator. It's some function of the data. I mean, suppose it's the mean divided by 12. How do you know whether that's good or bad? One thing you can do is, gen is create a world, which is basically a, a probability model. You can draw data from that world. You can uh, apply your function, apply the estimator to the data, and then see if you can recover the parameters of the data generation process. Right? So it's very good. Simulation is very good for evaluating estimators. It's also very good for calculating features of probability densities. Um, uh, and so if you have a probability density and you want to calculate the expected value, well, there's a, there's a formula you can use to calculate that. It involves an, in, an integral. Or if you know how to take random draws from the density, then what you can do is just take random draws from the density, lots of random draws, add them up and divide by n, and that can approximate the expected value. <clears throat> um, you can uh, also use simulation to take the results of statistical models that are often complicated and hard to understand and hard to interpret, and you can translate them into meaningful results of, uh, at, that are designed to estimate a specific quantity designed to be your quantity of interest. Um, in fact, you can decide what the quantity is because you get to decide what's of interest. It should never be the case that you let your computer program make decisions for you. So your computer program should, uh, prints things out in ways that are convenient to who? To the computer programmer, not to, your, not to you for substance. For you, what you need to do is, change the is choose the quantity of interest and change the statistical results, transform the statistical results into an easy to understand um, uh, setup that, uh, that, others, um, can, uh, that you can use to persuade others and they can understand your results. A cool thing about all this is that to get the right answer, you can use simulation. It's much easier. We know from, uh, from a lot of research, uh, actual edu educational research, that if you give students, if you teach students extremely well mathematical calculations about how to solve probability problems, let's say, uh, <clears throat> and then you teach others how to do simulation, turns out you can get the right answer much more frequently if you do it by simulation. So we'll show you how to get the right answer. It'll be really a really useful tool to solve probability problems in ways that might have confused you otherwise. Humans actually are not very good at probability problems. I mean, the things that seem intuitive to us are often not true, um, but we can figure out whether they're, whether they're correct. Um, okay, what the heck is simulation? Let me just give you a feel for this. We're gonna compare um, survey sampling and simulation. They're actually, very, they're actually going to be very, very similar to each other. They're going to be parallels to each other. <clears throat> In survey sampling, which I, I take it you, you have some knowledge of, um, we're going to learn about a population by taking a random sample from the population and then analyzing the random sample in order to infer back to the population. For in simulation, we learn about a probability distribution by taking random draws from the probability distribution and trying to infer back to the distribution. It turns out it's often relatively easy to take random draws from a distribution, even if it turns out to be very difficult to calculate certain quantities from the distribution. 
Second is, we can use a random sample in survey sampling to estimate some feature of the population, like the mean or the variance or the probability of winning or something like that. In simulation, we can use random draws to approximate a feature of a distribution in exactly the same way. Uh, <clears throat> the estimate in survey sampling is arbitrarily precise. Arbitrarily means as precise as you want. All you need to do is increase the sample size larger and larger. For simulation, the approximation of the, of the quantities, the features of the probability distributions, it are arbitrarily precise for a larger and larger number of simulations. Now, the cool thing about this particular comparison is that for survey sampling, you have to spend more money to collect more observations or more time in the field or longer writing your dissertation. Um, for simulation, you just run the computer program longer. So basically, you can get answers as precise as you want. You just let the computer run a little longer. Okay. Then finally, we can estimate, for example, the mean of the population by taking random draws and taking the average. We can estimate the mean of a distribution by taking random draws from the distribution and taking the average. We can, of course, estimate any other quantity in exactly the same way. You want to estimate the variance? You take random draws, calculate the variance. You want to estimate the mean divided by the variance? You can do the same thing. Okay. All right. Let me give you a feel for how simulation is going to make our life easier. So you may have heard of this problem, maybe not. Um, this is Monty Hall, who was the, who was the host of a game show. <clears throat> the game show was called Let's Make a Deal. And the idea is that there were three doors. There was door number one, door number two, and door number three. And behind two of the doors that you didn't know which was which, there were goats. And behind the third door, there was a car. <clears throat> and just to be clear, you don't want the goat, you do want the cars. Okay? So you're going to have to do what it takes to get the car and not the goats. Okay. So choose, so here's the idea. Choose one of three doors, two with goats, one with a car. Okay? That, that's your, that's, that's your, that's your, your goal is to choose one of the three doors. Your goal is to choose the right door. You don't have no idea which door is right. They all, they all look sort of the same. Monty, the host, peeks behind two of the unchosen doors, right? Like you choose one of the doors. He looks behind the other two doors and he opens the one or one of the two with the goat and asks, uh, you know, he throws that one away and he says, would you like to switch to the remaining door? And that's the question. Should you switch? Okay. Should you switch? And, that, that's the, and, and so how are we going to figure this out? The cool thing about this story is that um, uh, Ask Marilyn, who's one of these, uh, and one of these columnists in, a news, in newspapers, uh, like Ann Landers or Dear Abby, um, you'd write in and, and she'd answer questions. Uh, somebody wrote in with a question like this and she said, the answer is you should switch. Really? It doesn't seem like you should switch. It seems like, the, you know, it's sort of random, right? You know, if, like the probability of getting it right if you just choose one of the doors is clearly one out of three. If you switch, you're just picking a different door. It feels like it's still one out of three, okay? So lots of famous mathematicians, or several, several famous mathematicians or statisticians wrote in and said, you, you know, Marilyn, the famous ass Marilyn, you're, you're, you're not right. This is actually incorrect. Um, and other people wrote in and said, no, she is right. No, she's not. Let's figure out whether she's right. Okay. Um, turns out she was right. Okay. All right. So instead of trying to figure it out by probability, which is hard because the idea of it stands to reason doesn't actually work for humans, right? We're really bad at some of these things. So we're going to do this by simulation. Suppose we have no intuition. Suppose we don't trust our intuition, which is actually the right conclusion. So, so we wrote this, this code. Here's how it works, okay? So, first we're gonna create a bunch of simulations, 1,000 simulations. <clears throat> then we're gonna have two counters. We're gonna have a counter, we're just gonna run 1,000 experiments. For each one, we're gonna count up the number of times we would win if we did not switch, that's win, no switch, and the number of times we would win if we did switch. All right, so that's, that's, that's the setup here. There's gonna be three doors, so we collect them, door, door number one, door number two, and door number three. Then we have a loop. This loop goes from i equal one, I, from i equal one to i equal sims, and it's this whole area in here. And it goes from here to the part that's not indented. 
All right, what, what happens in this? So for each one of the thousand draws, we're going to do the following things. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to sample one of the doors. We're going to simulate what you would do if you were playing the game. You would sample one of the doors. So you sample one number from the vector of three doors and you put it into wind door. So in wind door is either the number one or the number two or the number three. We don't know which. Um, it'll be different in each of the thousand simulations. <clears throat> um, that's the winning door, sorry. That's the winning door. And then there's the choice of doors which you would choose and that's, that's your choice. So the winning door is, that's where the car is. The choice is, is your choice. All right, so now two things, two things could happen and we're going to try to count them, count them both up. If your choice is the same as the winning door, then no switch is, is clearly the right thing to do because you've already chosen the right answer. So what we do is we advance this counter. So we win no switch, win no switch is equal to win no switch plus one, so we advance the counter. <clears throat> the other counter <clears throat> is, what, it, it, it is what happens if you, if you do switch. So let's, let's look at that. So, after, so what happens is Monty opens up one of the doors and the doors left indicator is which doors are left. So if you pick door number one, then the doors left are two and three. <clears throat> um, and which are these doors? So what this does is it takes the vector of doors and it drops all of them except uh, when doors are not equal to, to choice. So it keeps all the rest. That's what doors left are. And then it, then it just asks one more question. If any of the doors left is the winning door, then advance the win switch counter. So basically we're going to compare the win no switch counter to the win switch counter. So the win no switch counter is this divided by sims. So the number out of a th the number uh, which could go up to a thousand of win no switch divided by a thousand and the number win switch divided by a thousand. So we're going to run this thing. And you know, it's a good idea for you to think about how it's going to come out. I've sort of already told you, but why should it come out one way? Why should it come out another way? Okay, I ran it. I ran it four times. <clears throat> and in each of the time, it would, in the, you know, the first time with a thousand simulations, uh, win no switch won about a third of the time. And win switching, if you, if you switched each time, it would win about two thirds of the time. Uh, now notice several things here. So first of all, that's surprising, okay? That's not your intuition. Um, that's pretty weird. But it is actually true. We know that because we just did the simulation. So you don't have to trust your intuition. We can build the intuition on the true answer. It's much easier to do that, which we'll get to in a second. But secondly, note these numbers differ and these numbers differ. Why do they differ? Because it's not the truth, right? It's random samples. Um, and when we run it each time, there's some variability. Now, if we wanted a number that was correct to the first decimal point, this is fine. If we want it to a number that is correct to three decimal points, then we would just do it with more simulations because, as I said, the answer is, arbit is arbitrarily precise if we just increase the number of simulations. So let's just go back here and just ask ourselves, why intuitively is this right? It's sort of crazy. Okay, the reason why is because you, there's three doors, you choose one, the winner is one, how often are they going to agree? Clearly one third of the time. That's the win no switch. So what about this? So how often does the win, is the winning door equal to the doors left? There's two doors left. This is any one of the doors left. So you get two chances with the doors left. That's basically how it works. And if you look at this, you may not have the intuition at all right at the beginning. You probably don't have the intuition at all right at the beginning. I didn't have the intuition at the beginning. Humans usually do not, do not have the intuition at the beginning. But if you, if you write out the code, number one, you'll get the right answer. Number two, if you look closely, you'll get the intuition also. So it's actually a really great strategy. Okay, let me give you one more example. This is known as the birthday problem. <clears throat> Famous probability problem. Also, utterly unintuitive. Well, a, great, a great psychology example as to why it just doesn't make any sense. Okay, there's a room with 24 randomly selected people from the population. <clears throat> we put them all in a room. What's the probability that at least two have the same birthday? What I usually do in class is, you know, we usually have a class with larger than, with more than 24 people, and we ask everybody, like, we, like, what's the probability that more than two of you have the same birthday? Okay, so forget the intuition. Let's just first get the right answer, then let's develop the intuition. 
we can get the right answer by simulation. So we'll start off with 1,000 simulations. 1,000 is not the correct number, it's just a starting point. <clears throat> um, I'm gonna model this so we have 24 people in the, in the room. Uh, we're gonna write down all the days, so the days go from one to 365. Note there's no leap year, this is a model, right? So models ignore things, I'm ignoring, I'm ignoring the leap year. So now I wanna know for each of the 1,000 simulations, how many of those simulations have two or more birthdays on the same day. So this is my same day counter. Now I'm gonna run a, a test for each of the date, for each of the simulations, for each of the thousand simulations. This is for simulations from one to sims. I'm gonna, gonna do these three calculations. Okay, so what do we do with those three calculations? The first calculation <clears throat> is it, it just samples. It samples 24 people, because that's what we have people set at from all days, which is 300, a vector of 365 numbers, and with, with replacement. So it randomly draws one number from, the three, from 365, then it puts that number back, randomly draws another number, and then we wanna see whether any of them are the same. How are we gonna figure that out? Well, we just do this little calculation here. This is, how, this is how it works. What we do is we take the room, which is the results of this, and we figure out, well, how many people in the room? We know there's 24. Then we take the unique birthdays in the room, so that'll eliminate any duplicates, and we wanna know whether there were any duplicates, right? So we just count how many people are in the room after we eliminate the duplicates, that's the length, and we just wanna know, is that less than 24, right? Which is basically, are there any duplicates? That's the question. And if there are, then at least two people have the same birthday, and we decide to advance same day by one, same day equals same day plus one. Then we take the result here, which is the probability um, that at least two have the same birthday, uh, is equal to same day divided by uh, 1,000. And if we run this, it turns out that a little more than half have the same birthday. I ran it four times. I'm getting different answers each time because it's based on random numbers with different random seeds. Um, <clears throat> and, you know, it's a surprising result. So a, a, a better, uh, even more unintuitive way to explain this, to ask the question, is... <clears throat> um, how many people do you need to have in a room, randomly selected and put in the room, for the probability that two or more have the same birthday to be at least 0.5? How many people do you need to have in the room before you are willing to bet that two or more have the same birthday? When would you take the bet? How many people are required to be in the room? And there's 365 to begin with, so here's the it stands to reason. 365, you want two or more to have the same birthday, so it feels like it's something like half that number, right? right? So maybe like 180 or something like that. It's not true, okay? The actual answer is it's really small, it's only 24. And the reason why is because it's not like the first half has to match the second half, it's like the first person can match uh, 364 different days and the second person can match any of those and so, um, and you can actually see it. When, if we were doing this live, I would ask the first person for, to, to just say what their birthday was. And if anybody um, uh, had the same birthday, they would just raise their hand um, <clears throat> or shout out something. Um, and then we go to the second person and I'd ask anybody to do that. And the third person, right? So the first person, if there's 24 people in the room, the first person has 23 possible matches. The second person doesn't have 23 possible matches because the first person we already know doesn't match, but has 22 possible matches. The third person has 21 possible matches all the way down. And if you add all those up, actually it becomes a big number, okay? So that's, that's the basic idea. Okay, so that's where we are. We've done overview and logistics, statistical models, data generation processes with simulation I just completed. And, and then the next topic that we're gonna get to is probability as a model of the data generation process. We're gonna get into the details of the prob probability models. Okay, so I'll see you next time.